Hello and welcome to Family Matters, a webinar from the Deseret News and the Institute for Family Studies. On Family Matters, we tackle the most important questions related to our most important institution, the family. I'm Brad Wilcox, Professor of Sociology at the University of Virginia, Senior Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies, and a contributor at Deseret News. And on this edition, we're very happy to welcome Carol Hooven from Harvard University. She's talking with us today about her new book, T, The Story of Testosterone, The Hormone That Dominates and Divides Us. And Professor Hooven's book offers an incisive and engaging journey that helps us to understand the role that this powerful hormone plays in the animal kingdom and in our own social world. Today, we're gonna to focus on the part that testosterone plays in the relationship between the sexes. And so the first question I'd like to sort of begin with is this, how did kind of your own experience as a teenager uh, shape the intellectual journey that has brought you to your current scholarship and to this book in uh, particular? First of all, Brad, thanks for the introduction and thanks for uh, having me. And it's a pleasure to be talking with you. And you're just diving right in there. I hope you know what you're getting into asking me about my life as a teenager. Do you have any idea what I'm gonna say? You no, know, I've, I've heard you talk a bit about this with uh, Richard Reeves, a friend at Brookings. And so I thought this was you know, an interesting kind of way to begin our conversation. Yeah, it's, and I, I'm glad that you asked. Um, and I want everybody listening to think back. We all had really different experiences as a teenager. I just should say one of the things I'm really interested in on is what it must be like to be a boy going through puberty and being a teenager and perhaps feeling overwhelmed by a lot of feelings and changes. Um, I was on you know, the other side, obviously. So I was a, a, a girl kind of coming into myself as an adult, uh, a reproductively viable being. That's what it means to be a teenager. That's why our bodies are transitioning. So for me, I did not have a family. It's, this is difficult to talk about, but I think it's really important because we are talking about the family and the importance of parenting. My parents were not attentive and uh, I had all the freedom in the world. I had a lot of energy and I got into some situations that were difficult for me to handle. I didn't have parental advice. I didn't have a lot of maturity. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. And the people who paid attention to me were those boys who might've been feeling overwhelmed by their feelings. And there was some sexual assault involved. And I, that's not, unfortunately, that's really not surprising. Um, I have a boy and um, I'm gonna be really, and I'm already talking to him about sex and respect and, uh, but nobody ever had these kinds of conversations with me. And there's some lasting damage and a lot of lasting questions. And I think part of my drive to understand men, and I've had, I should say a lot of men in my life who've been absolutely supportive and wonderful to me, everybody's complicated though. But I think it is those early experiences, partly in my struggles to come to terms with how they shaped me that did help to fuel my curiosity and drive to research testosterone. I think we all, especially academics, when we're focused on one narrow area, um, you know, there were reasons in our past that are not just purely intellectual. So I think that is that those experiences did contribute to my motivation. So if we think about kind of the broader conversation that's sort of swirling around these issues, you know, it's certainly the case that many in the ivory tower and, you know, in the mainstream media would tend to kind of minimize the importance of biology in understanding our social world. And so when we kind of are thinking about and talking about sex and love and marriage and family, um, I think there is kind of this idea that it's all about nurture and, you know, it's about culture and socialization and economics. Um, and that nature is largely treated, you know, as if it's largely irrelevant from our kind of conversation and thinking about these topics. And I think as I've kind of, you know, taken in your book, you take a different view here. And so can kind of just from the, the big picture to kind of begin our conversation, can you tell us how you think about nature and nurture um, as they you know, interact with one another to kind of shape our social lives? And do you kind of have an example you could kind of give to the audience that would sort of illustrate how you think about how nature and nurture um, influence our social lives? 
Sure, thank you. So of course, this is an incredibly important question that comes up all the time in so many uh, different areas. And you just answered the question. I mean, I still have a lot to say, but you gave the answer, which is that nature and nurture are always interacting. And it is never, especially when talking about complex behaviors, especially when talking about and what I'm talking about, and I think what um, you're also talking about, are patterns of behavior in a lot on a large scale. I'm not talking about individuals, like why did John engage in this particular behavior and Mary did not, or, you know, that's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about large, consistent differences in patterns of behavior in humans and in non-human animals. And how do we explain these patterns? So that's um, number one. And so for any particular behavior, uh, there's, oh, of course, behavior happens via our bodies and our brains. And it's always affected by the environment that we're in right now, but it's also infected, uh, affected like what I just talked about. All of us have histories, all of us have cultures, all of us have potentially religion, family values, school systems, laws, all of these things have a massive influence on how we behave. So one example that has to do with the family that anyone with kids or who is annoyed by other people's kids can relate to would be think about um, either your own kids or the annoying kid at the table next to yours at a restaurant. I do this myself and I know I shouldn't be so judgy because my kid is, you know, of course, great and great at restaurants. But um, if say you're out to dinner, you're trying to have a nice uh, romantic dinner, maybe the kids are with a babysitter, the five-year-old kid at the table next to yours is out of control. He or she is making tons of noise, maybe even throwing things or heaven forbid, running around the restaurant, right? Now, what, how do you explain that behavior, right? Would you do that? Would you engage in that kind of behavior? Would pretty much any person without you know, severe mental illness engage who's an adult in those behaviors? No. The reason that we don't and children tend to is because they have a biological predisposition. It has something to do with the development of their brain and their learning. And uh, however, you will find huge differences in the degree to which any particular kid in any family, in any country, in any religion, you know, it completely depends. All of those things are going to have a huge impact on how that kid behaves in the restaurant. Almost all of them are gonna want to be crazy, right? Men may want to beat the crap out of other men way more than I wanna beat the crap out of women. However, the degree to which that behavior, that predisposition is expressed depends almost 100% on the environment. Culture is unbelievably important. And this is the point that so many sort of nature deniers miss because they are scared of the power of nature, of possibly legitimizing these behaviors that may be problematic. But instead what they're doing is handicapping our under our ability to really get to the core of the forces that shape all kinds of human behavior. And it's especially important when we're talking about behavior that is, uh, needs to be addressed and that is uh, troublesome for us socially. So that's, I think, an example that can clearly illustrate the importance of nature and culture, even in the face of strong biological predispositions for a particular behavior. Right. And I think you've mentioned, you know, thinking about kind of men and propensities to violence, for instance, to kind of build on your point that, you know, these propensities exist in, you know, uh, in men across the globe. But we see different, obviously, levels of violent crime in, say, Singapore, That's you know, right. versus San Francisco. And that is related in part to the sort of the, the social environment. Yeah. And just to add on one that, and that's excellent. And just to add on one point to that, although we see variations across cultures in the mostly uh, level of male uh, physical crime, because that's, you know, men say commit 95% of the murders pretty much everywhere. Uh, so those, the fact of that sex difference is something that doesn't vary. Men always everywhere commit uh, more physical violence by far than women. However, the proportion of men who commit physical violence varies tremendously because of culture, but that sex difference is never inverted. And that is because of nature. So it's always an interaction. 
So um, to kind of get to the focus of your book, when it comes to testosterone, you know, um, what's sort of the big story in terms of how it affects people's general behavior and orientation? Um, and particularly as that kind of relates to relationships, would you say? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's a big um, question that can be answered any number of ways. And I would want to start off by just thinking about non-human animals. So um, we know, it, just leave hum, humans out of it for a second, because it's very easy to conceive of the function of testosterone and how it shapes male behavior in non-human animals. So in the book, there's one chapter I talk about red deer. And uh, I had this great trip to Scotland, to the Isle of Rum, to study the red deer uh, during the rut, which is mating season, because that's when testosterone is at its height and male aggression is at its height, libido and sex is at its height, the weaponry on its head, the uh, antlers are really sharpened and males use want to use also the sperm that are now being made during mating season. They wanna use all of those things. They wanna use the sperm, they wanna use their weapons and testosterone coordinates the physical and behavioral traits that are necessary for male reproduction. Male reproduction more than female reproduction requires uh, benefits from increased access to mates in humans and in non-human animals relative to females. So humans are neat because males actually invest in their offspring in many cases. Uh, so don't need to be so physically aggressive. And that's a whole other story. But in general, across mammals and, and many other taxa, uh, testosterone is the way that natural selection has shaped males uh, to help them increase access to mates. And that is often uh, via male-male aggression. So that is also true for humans. It's not, uh, again, we have culture so that uh, male aggression is stemmed to some degree. And also because males in invest in their offspring, they can't always be looking for other mates and always being physically aggressive. They can benefit reproductively from being paternal. And that's incredibly important in humans. So I would say if we apply that evolutionary logic to humans, also taking our culture uh, into consideration, I would say males more than females on average are more uh, oriented to compete for dominant status, for uh, also for status or and or the resources that they need to acquire either a high number of mates uh, potentially to compete for them, or to acquire the resources that they need to uh, compete for what we would say is a higher quality mate, a female who looks like she has a lot of reproductive potential and might be a really good mom, also attractive and interesting and loving and kind and intelligent and all of that. So I would say that testosterone, in addition to the physical effects, of course, on the development and maintenance of the reproductive structures and sperm production and increasing the body size and muscle mass, Along with these things, there is an increased propensity for physical aggression. However, most males are not physically, uh, super physically aggressive. So these, we do see these on the extremes. We do see the expression of that tendency in cultures that allow it somehow. But in cultures that don't, we don't see that uh, expression to the same extent. And then in terms of, you know, um... What is the distribution when it comes to testosterone in terms of, is it overlapping bell curves, you know, for women and men, or are they not overlapping much at all? How do you, what do we see kind of in the sciences about how um, testosterone is found on, you know, in women and men? And, and again, how much of those, those bell curves overlap? Great. Um, so there is an effort by those who want to downplay the biological contributions to sex differences and sort of play up the environmental contributions, there is an effort to somehow show that testosterone levels are really overlapping and really there isn't that much difference or that testosterone just really isn't that important. I have a, uh, as you probably know, I, in the book, I go into some detail about this argument because I think it's really important. Testosterone levels come nowhere near overlapping in healthy populations. Uh, so the typical man and the typical woman will be, they're completely distinct bell curves. The female curve is quite narrow. There's a tiny, tiny amount of testosterone. There's a very small range and females are very sensitive to increases uh, at the, to even getting into the top of that range or outside of that, uh, over the top of the female range. We're very sensitive to that. 
So men have about 10 to 20 times on average more testosterone than women. You could see some overlap in some situations where there's an illness or somebody has been taking uh, exogenous steroids um, and then they go off them. If you go off them, your testes have been shut down when you're on steroids. So when you come off steroids, you can be, have very, very low testosterone levels. If you're sick, if you're getting treatment for prostate cancer, there's all kinds of reasons why the male levels could be very low, but typical healthy male levels are 10 to 20 times higher than female levels. There's just no overlap there. Uh, and so that argument really doesn't have any teeth. There, again, there are some circumstances where there might be overlap. I should just say in some of the research that the critics are sort of touting, there are uh, biological males who are included in the female category. And uh, that causes, it, it depends on who you're calling male and female. You've got to call, uh, you can only include biological females in the female testosterone range and biological males in the male testosterone range. There are a lot of people who, who don't think that that's what we should be doing. We should go by self ID or other ways of determining sex. And that does create some uh, overlap if you're obviously including sure. the opposite sex in the, in the range. Okay. Um, and so when we kind of, you know, begin to think about how this kind of plays out across the life course, you know, what's sort of the story here um, in terms of how testosterone and other hormones are, you know, kind of playing out across life course, we could begin by thinking about kids, you know, um, and their approach to play. And as you know, there are many in the academy and the media who would want us to think that how boys and girls interact when it comes to play is driven by um, nurture, by, by, by culture, the social environment. Um, and because they take this view, they want, you know, toy companies and stores to kind of eliminate products or sections that are, you know, separated out for boys and girls. There's been obviously discussion at Target, for instance, on this, uh, on this issue. Um, so, you know, what do you, what's your perspective in terms of thinking about how boys and girls kind of engage the social world, particularly when it comes to play and how we might think about, you know, toys and, and, and the like, um, and even sort of um, its implications for, you know, for, for commerce here? Yeah. Um, so, good. Uh, again, I'm going to start with non-human animals, and because uh, it's so easy for us to to think about these differences, uh, they, they're much less complicated in many ways when we think about non-human animals. So I can talk about chimps easily, and I, I'll also refer to rats because I, I spent eight months with wild chimpanzees uh, in Uganda before I got my PhD at Harvard, and I didn't know a lot about the research on juvenile play, but it was it's clear as day that the uh, little male chimps play more with other male chimps and play more have more physical play. Uh, and that's well documented. And also, and this happens across many uh, species in species where it's beneficial. So play is a way to practice skills that we need for adulthood. And that's why play is so much fun because these are, you know, you have to be motivated as a kid to practice various skills. So physical play among boys in humans, um, a lot of the time is called is rough and tumble play. Again, I've got a 12 year old. He is still it's amazing. Uh, and he's a pretty gentle kid overall, but he, he loves wrestling his friends who come over and they will wrestle hard and they will try to pin each other down and they love it. And they're laughing. And there's just a lot of physical play. And I don't have a girl, so I can't comment, but the literature shows and my own you know, anecdotal observations of the world show that this is not typically how girls play with each other. It's very different. Um, and so I talk about rats in the book a little bit and rat play because rats do the same thing. Male rats play very physically. They look like they're having fun. It doesn't look scary. Uh, nobody's running away and hiding because they're worried they're gonna um, get hurt, but they're doing sort of the same thing that little boys do, which is standing up on their, in the case of the rats, hind legs and kind of boxing each other with their front legs and um, rolling each other, rolling around and trying to pin each other down. That's very common. In rats, it's clear that you can manipulate the expression of that behavior by changing 
prenatal exposure to testosterone. So in mammals, male testicles are producing very high levels of testosterone in utero or directly after birth, depending uh, upon the species. That testosterone that their own testicles are producing gets into the brain in humans and non-human animals. And it shapes the development of the brain in ways that promote male reproductive behavior. And that play, even though testosterone hasn't gone up yet in puberty, they're not sexual animals, it's still practicing for reproductive behavior, which is physical male-male competition. Boys love it. And the evidence from non-human animals and some evidence from humans suggests that that play is really shaped by male levels of testosterone exposure prenatally. And um, in the book, I talk about some evidence that shows in humans for female fetuses, if they're exposed to unusually high levels of testosterone for various reasons, um, those girls are more likely to engage in rough and tumble play and also to want to play with the kinds of toys that boys tend to like with, to play with. So more likely to want to play with trucks and planes and guns rather than uh, other kinds of toys that tend to be preferred by girls. Those girls are also more likely to grow up to have male typical interests and even to have a non-heterosexual uh, orient, sexual orientation. So there's a strong evidence that the sexes do play differently. This is consistent across cultures and that this is adaptive behavior that is related to reproduction and shaped by differences in early exposure to testosterone. Culture matters again um, in the, you know, how much kids are allowed to play, the kind of play, the toys, et cetera. Uh, but this is, you know, uni pretty universal and consistent with non-human animals. So as far as the economics of it, I personally, um, because there are some kids who are gender non-conforming and a lot of these kids grow up to be gay and they feel different in their, uh, for their sex and their behavior as kids. And this can be very difficult for them. They're subject to bullying, et cetera. Nobody's conditioning those kids to behave in that way. The way that they're behaving is just the way that they feel typically. And they might, like if a, a little boy who's likely to grow up to be gay, might be more apt to wanna to play with girls and girls toys and use a, a more feminine style of play. I think that's totally fine. And so I feel for that kid going into the toy store and having like toys for girls and toys for boys. And maybe it's embarrassing to go to the toys for girls aisle. So I'm kind of in favor of loosening up those marketing schemes uh, and just giving kids their choices. But from a economic point of view and capitalist point of view, it makes sense. They're gonna capitalize on what exists, which is girls like these kinds of toys and boys like these kinds of toys. So it might make sense to market them that way. So I understand that. Okay. Um, as we kind of, again, move down a life course in our thinking here, um, how do these hormonal differences, um, you know, shape how young men and women are kind of approaching, you know, sex and their initial romantic relationships? You know, like what, what's the sort of like, what's your, your books, what's your, your per, kind of your takeaway about how we should think about how, um, and again, we're talking about on average, because there's, there's yeah, again, there's going to be a range, you know, as you were just getting at, you know, not everyone's going to be, you know, following one particular path, obviously, but kind of, you know, what is sort of the, um, in part here, the average story for young women and young men as they kind of move into romantic relationships, sexual relationships as adolescents? So, uh, I'm glad you said, what is my takeaway? Because here in humans, it is sort of harder to say, you know, this, these really complex social behaviors are due to sex differences in testosterone. Sure. However, um, I, from everything that I know and all the research I have done, I think they are heavily, heavily shaped by testosterone, but they're also, the culture here is so important. Right. It's hard to know if there weren't any restrictions, social right. restrictions on female sexual behavior, what would we see? And, and we know that almost everywhere there are also social uh, restrictions for- And just, and just to break in, we, you know, we obviously even on this, we see you know, a, a great deal of heterogeneity in how adolescents relate when it comes to sex and romance in countries you know, from the Netherlands to 
um, you know, to Nigeria, to India, right. to the U.S. So clearly in all of this, culture plays a, a major role. But what I'm trying to get at here is sort of how do you think, you know, nature may have some hand in yeah. what happens? Yeah. So thank you for saying all that. Um, and that's, I, I would have said that, and that's all right. And uh, what is clear, again, is that across cultures, men express the two big sex differences, and these start appearing at puberty. Uh, so I'll just say young men uh, and men express a desire for a uh, more sexual variety, a higher number of sexual partners over their lifetimes. And women express uh, a desire for less sexual variety. And um, that is one of the biggest things. And the other one is just libido. And uh, we that it's clear that changing testosterone changes libido. So if you, and we might talk about this later, but if you're transgender and you go from female to male levels of testosterone, your libido really shoots up before any physical changes. This also happens in in male animals, you can manipulate libido by manipulating testosterone. So it's clear that the male sort of sexual style is heavily impacted by male typical levels of testosterone. That is all emerging at puberty. And there are uh, different, of course, males and females are experiencing very different feelings in my view and, and from just, being a person in the world and doing this research and actually just talking about the book with so many different people, especially men who have opened up to me about what it was like for them during puberty. And I heard some really upsetting uh, stories from men who just felt guilty, uh, for one thing, for feeling such a strong sexual desire and a, even a motivation to objectify women sexually. I'm not saying that everyone's doing that, but it seemed like that was difficult for teenage men, boys in particular, to navigate. How do I, I have all these feelings, they're really powerful. How do I know how to act on them? Who can I talk to about how I feel? And what I think is happening socially is that boys and men are being made to feel guilty about these feelings. Um, and shamed to some extent. There's, you know, toxic is associated with these feelings, I think. And I think that's a problem. I think we should be opening up space for people to have conversations. Of course, women and, and uh, young women understandably are annoyed and angry about some aspects of the, these sure. behaviors, but I think that shutting down conversation and shaming is not gonna help uh, young men get what they need, which is support for how to deal with what can be overwhelming feelings. I also heard from a couple of people that this was a wonderful, wonderful time. And this happened to be a gay man. And I, I wonder if there's something to that because he was free to, um, he knew that the people he wanted to have sex with pretty much felt like he did and it wasn't so difficult. And uh, so I'm not an you know expert on obviously being a young man, I know what it's like to be a young woman. And I don't remember having those really intense sexual, yes, it's a time when you have a sexual awaken, awakening, but it didn't seem, and the other women I've talked to and the research I've done, the urgency is what is, seems to be very different and that sort of constant and overwhelming desire. Uh, yeah. And obviously, and you touched on this even in your opening comments, but the, the dark side to all this, right, is that, you know, is that the sort of the sexual assault, the sexual assault kind of piece of this um, larger puzzle is, you know, again, kind of the, the, the darker expression of, yeah. of this dynamic. And do you have any thoughts about kind of what, um, what we can as, as a culture do to, um, you know, based upon your research, you're thinking discourage sexual assault on the part of, you know, just more common on the part of young men than, than women. Like what, how can we kind of use the wisdom you've um, accumulated to address that particular issue? Yeah, okay, this is again, such an important question. Um, so I think the first thing is to somehow make it safe for young men to talk about how they feel and the challenges they are facing. They have to have role models. They have to have people 
uh, who they feel they, you know, who they respect, who this ideally would happen in the family. I mean, for me, it's me and my son, but partly because of what I do sure. and we're always right. talking about this stuff, it's probably driving them nuts. Um, so the shaming of feelings and masculinity to me just needs to end. I think it's a, that's a huge problem in my view. And there's nothing obviously wrong with being male, being masculine, having those feelings. They're going to happen. It can be wonderful, you know? Sure, uh, sure. And I know that this is in some quarters un unpopular, but I wish someone had spoken to me to help me understand more about male nature. I'm not blaming myself. I'm not blaming the victim, but I am saying it can help to educate young women about the circumstances that they're more, that put them more at risk. And I think that there's just no way that should be off the table. It's not blaming the victim. It's sharing information. It's educating. It's helping. It's giving women uh, information, important information to make choices. And that doesn't mean that anyone deserved, you know, anything right. bad to happen to them. Right. However, more information is always better than less. And that's all I would say is that we need to educate both sexes about sexual assault and how to reduce it. And um, that means that we have to have somewhat of a safe environment, I think, to do that. And of course, Me Too and that whole movement, I think, is very useful in just raising awareness and helping men to be more aware of some of the things they're doing they might may not have even understood uh are contributing to sexual assault and now they do and now there's more they have to take more responsibility so kind of moving again down the life course if we think about husbands and wives um and obviously they approach a lot of their married lives in, in similar ways with sort of similar kind of goals and objectives but there are also differences as well on average, and you kind of touched on them in some of your comments um, and, and writings as well. Um, you know, so for instance, the feminist Carol Tavris argues that men tend to express affection more through actions and women more through talking. Um, and um, we could obviously think of other examples here too, but you've also kind of touched on your own marriage. So how, how do you, how does, how does sort of hormones like, what is sort of in a sense like the insightful takeaway from your book for husbands and wives who are trying to sort of figure out, you know, um, how to navigate married life more successfully, how to understand their husband or their wife more, um, you know, with uh, greater, um, you know, greater insight? Yeah. So I wrote an article for a British paper about my husband and how my relationship changed based on, because of my research. And what I talked about there was the research that I did and the interviews that I did with transgender people who are um, changing their hormone levels and the ways in which those changes affected their feelings and behavior. And it's funny because I've been teaching about testosterone and researching it for so long. However, I, it wasn't until this particular body of literature and research, where really seeing that when a female per person um, takes male levels of testosterone and transitions to a male uh, gender identity and living as a male, and takes male typical levels of testosterone before the body changes and the muscles change and the beard grows. Um, the sex drive of course goes up and crying almost disappears. I mean, it depends. There's huge variation. Again, this, this is uh, just what on average, right. but crying um, is if a female person who used to cry, you know, fairly regularly, which is fairly normal for women, say once a week or, or even more, uh, once they transition and take these high levels of testosterone, I heard report after report of crying stopping of these um, trans men saying that they wanted to cry, they had some sense of a feeling, but it wouldn't come out. And right. overall, the description was also of, uh, again, on average, uh, that the ability to access a large range of emotions diminished. The emotion that doesn't diminish is anger. It doesn't necessarily increase, but that seemed to be the one emotion that was very salient and accessible, but the kind of weaker, I'll say weaker and more vulnerable emotions like 
fear uh, and anxiety um, and vulnerability in general kind of decreased. And my husband and I had been in couples counseling actually for a while. And part of it I am now taking responsibility for was my kind of insistence that he open up. And uh, he is British and it's true <laughs> that the Brits are in fact, less emotionally expressive. Um, right. He's a philosopher. So I've got a whole, yeah, he's, he's not like me. I'm yeah. all over the place emotional and I'm talk, 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 talk. And I wanted that same thing back. But I think part of why I was attracted to him in the first place sure. is because he's so, I didn't start crying. He's so stable. Sorry, I've been going through a little bit of a rough time lately and he's been absolutely wonderful. And I, and the point is that I think that's part of why I was attracted to him. I don't, I think I don't really want a guy who's anything like me um, in terms of my emotionality. I kind of sure. like the way that he is and that he's not all over the place. And I, but what happened is I did come to appreciate that whether it's testosterone or not in this specific case with my husband, it just almost doesn't matter, but I had an explanation. It's just the way he is and it's okay. He's fine. I don't need him to be like me. He is sure. supporting me, like you said, in these other ways that I need to do, I need to open up to. He doesn't have to show his feelings in the way that I show mine. And it really was appreciating testosterone, weirdly, that helped me to have this insight. And I have to say, like things have really improved and it's because I changed. Um, you know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't work on your marriage and have conversations and really listen to each other, but that was sort of a major moment, which is weird and doing more accepting. So I've got two more kind of questions before I wrap up here that, but, and they kind of, were going down the life course a little more, I mean, for the, you know, so let's think about fatherhood or, you know, men and families, Yeah. You know, with these two questions. And I, I can remember saying at a, a, a Brookings symposium that marriage and family life domesticate men. And, you know, the, the eye rolls around the room were, <laughs> were something to behold. Um, but as I, as I kind of read about, you know, sort of the issue of, of hormones and fatherhood and men, um, which you touched on in your book, I've seen other places as well. It does seem like when men are in, you know, a romantic relationship that's, you know, uh, residential, uh, marriage, for instance, um, and then when they reside with their children, their biological children, it seems to reduce their their testosterone in ways that you know basically correlate with the kind of the domesticity idea that there's something about being in a family that makes men kind of physically change and become more domestic and settle down a bit. How would you think about that story? Brad, you just said it all uh, beautifully. It's actually, I think it's just your spot on. Uh, and again, I'm going to use my husband as an example. He did not want kids. He had no interest in, in kids. I didn't have my kid till four, I was 43. So I had my kid later in life. Uh, how old was he? Um, he was almost 50. Okay. And he just didn't ever want kids. But then when you know, he finally said, okay, we could try. And like, boom, I got pregnant really quickly. But the point is he had no interest. He thought kids were a big pain in the butt and not interesting whatsoever. And what happens is what, again, happens in non-human animals, right? The male, will, a high testosterone male is out looking for females. He's picking fights with other males. He's trying to acquire and defend territory. Once he's, it depends on the species, but because there aren't a lot of uh, mammals in which the male has anything to do with the kids. But in birds, we see this all over the place because they require two parents. And in order for say a male song sparrow, to help for him to uh, tend to his kids, which he has to do. He, the female has to stay on the nest to some extent and he has to go get the food and work. We have nests in our yard and I watched the male go back and forth, back and forth with worms and insects all day long. It's amazing the amount of work that he will put into it. And that is because uh, sexual selection conditions him to do that because this is what helps his genes make it into the next generation. His testosterone goes down. In, and if you raise his testosterone while he's trying to be a dad, he will abandon his kids and go out looking for sex and trying to pick fights. That happens. So it's interesting that we see this in some animals in which the male has to provide care in order for the kids to survive. It's not the case in humans that males have to provide care. However, in many situations, this is a great option 
it's the best way for males to maximize the number of kids they have to stick with one female, to be a great partner to her, to support her, to support the kids. And yeah, so men who uh, reside with their kids and especially physically interact with and care for their kids, there is somewhat of a suppression in testosterone, again, consistent with non-human animals. And it seems that this takes the attention away from competing, from going out and spending your energy on competing for new mates. You're using that reproductive part of your energy budget towards investing in your offspring instead. It's an excellent strategy. Some men can do better out on the open market and neglecting their kids. And we see that happen too. So we're men are kind of, I would say, I hate to use the term wired, but in a sense, wired to do either of those strategies. Um, but we see that socially, what does work best are monogamous pair bonds, because when we have a polygynous system and some men can have a lot of wives, you have a lot of men who don't have any mates. Those are young men who are angry, who are frustrated and who are committing most of the violence. You have higher rates of violence, uh, in societies where you don't have uh, monogamous pair bonds that are socially supported. So from a social point of view, yeah, everybody's pretty much better off when I would say the culture reinforces that to some extent. I don't know that that's the right you know, way to go, but the data and the research does suggest that this uh, tends to squash uh, or, or tamp down male uh, violence and kids do do better with two parents in the household. Uh, and, and you know, then there's a question of two males versus uh, and two females together in the household. But uh, uh, I think those are other arrangements that, you know, can do well. And it depends on having two devoted parents. But the, the point is that the, yes, the testosterone goes down in men somewhat when they're, when they have that, those stimuli of their babies. And that's what happened to my husband. So once the Griffin was born and he saw his own baby. It took him a little while. It took a little while to kick in as it does uh, the parental behavior. But now he can't even believe that he might've had a life without a kid, you know, and he's like a wonderful, wonderful dad. And that happens to so many men that it just kicks in because that's an adaptation that needs to be, you know, expressed when the kid is born. So the sort of a contrary example here when it comes again to sort of men and families is we see in the research on, um, domestic violence, on child abuse, on um, sexual abuse as well, that men who are not physically related to kids, but are co-residing with um, the mother, you know, um, in a household, you know, so the cohabiting, you know, um, boyfriend, you know, who's not related to the kids, there is a pattern of risk there, you know, elevated rates of abuse, for instance. Um, so what's this, I mean, is that, how do you think about that from your perspective? Is it that, you know, men who um, will have higher levels of testosterone, they don't have, it's, you know, how do you just, how do you think about, is there a biological story there that's maybe partly in play? What's, what's, what? Yeah, what's I mean, it's so, so sad. It's such a disturbing reality that that happens, but it does happen. And what you said is exactly right. Uh, that if the, man knows that the kid is not his biological offspring, then yes, he's tend, it tends to, I can't say that this is something that is, you know, has to do with testosterone, of course, except for women don't do this when they're um, stepmothers generally, you know, relative to men. Um, so there is this large sex difference. It is consistent cross culture And there's definitely some related behavior in non-human animals. Unfortunately, just from a purely evolutionary point of view, you know, it's cruel, but many times uh, like in gorillas, it's well known that if a new male uh, comes into a group, it makes sense for him to kill the offspring, the young offspring of the females in the group, because they're not gonna be able to get pregnant if they're still uh, say nursing those offspring. He, he wants them to come into estrus so that he can get right into reproducing. So it's adaptive for him to have that behavior. That's obviously an entirely different situation. And I don't want to suggest that it's not due also to human culture, which again, a lot, you know, is allowing roughly this type of uh, behavior. But and I can't say again that it is testosterone, but it is mo much more of a male typical behavior there. It's possible that there's some um, 
evolutionary component there that may be mediated by testosterone, but it's so complex and it's so uh, disturbing. And I think certainly we see that to some extent with, um, you know, serious, serious domestic abuse. And, um, you know, females are also capable of abusing their partners, but they tend not to kill them. They tend not to severely injure them, but males are much more likely to uh, kill or severely injure their partners. Uh, and that does seem related to attempts to control her sexual uh, and reproductive behavior, roughly. So the final question is that, well, the final comment here that I would invite you to respond to is sort of, I, I think that, um, you know, today we often, you know, don't think about or are unaware of the role that biology might play when it comes to love, sex, marriage, and family life. And so are there any kind of like final takeaways you would give to uh, women and men to sort of, you know, incorporate kind of biological thinking um, in sort of how they're experiencing um, sex, love, marriage, family life, you know, how might kind of incorporating this perspective where we're kind of thinking of, you know, to, to some extent about how biology is implicated in these, you know, different parts of our lives would make it, you know, easier for us to get along together as women and men. I love this question too. You're asking so many great questions and thank you for being so well prepared, well prepared and having so many really interesting questions. And I'm going to do something weird, uh, which is just jump to say, um, Trump and Biden voters, right? It's easy to, for a, I'll just say Democrat and Republican. It's easy for us to judge each other. It's sure. easy for us to say, this person behaves this way. And, um, I know where that's coming from and they're just bad people or they're stupid people or crazy people or whatever it is, right? But when you talk to an individual and you learn their story and you learn why they have the views that they do, your heart opens up a little bit and you maybe you disagree and maybe you don't totally understand, but there's a reason, right? You see somebody, somebody's background, maybe they really have a strong personal story and it just makes sense. Their views make sense. Maybe their behavior makes sense. And I mean, this is how I think about understanding biology. It's such a potent force in our lives. Testosterone, I wrote a whole book on it because it is such a potent force in all of our lives. It does shape our behavior. It does shape de sex differences. We don't really understand what it's like to be the opposite sex, what it's like to go through the world as the opposite sex. And as a woman, I wanna just really have a deeper understanding about the forces that are shaping the men in my life. It does help, I'm not gonna, that doesn't mean I'm gonna put up with any behavior that I find objectionable, but it does help to have explanations, not just for my personal relationships, but what I see going on politically, what I see going on in terms of violence. And I have to mention male heroism. I see examples of male, male heroism in my own life and in the news, women are, can be heroes too, but men are much more likely to risk their own lives for the benefit of others, to give their lives for the benefit of others. Um, so to have a way to make sense of all that, it helps my relationships and it just helps my understanding of what I'm observing in the world about how, how all these forces are interacting. I think it makes me a more uh, compassionate person and who's better able to solve some of the problems that we face. Well, it's a wonderful note on which to end our conversation, Dr. Hooven. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And again, I would encourage our listeners and, um, and viewers to uh, get uh, her new book, which is T. Um, and until here is the story of testosterone, the hormone that dominates and divides us. So thank you again for, uh, for joining us today for Family Matters. Thank you so much.